Welcome to Greybeard's Jewels, a step into the unknown. Episode 2, Men in Black. How far do you think the government might go in keeping us from knowing the truth about how alone in the universe we really are? Would they keep reports on UFOs highly classified, disclosed only to those at the very top of our democracy? Would they paint an entire legion of ufologists as brain buffoons to discredit their findings? And would they employ a team of highly trained, lethal, and possibly even supernatural men to keep the truth about alien life forms under wraps and control the flow of information our world receives about such matters? That's what many believers posit. That the Men in Black is not just a fictional organization heralded in comics and movies, but it is a real, deeply secretive, and highly controlling branch of our federal government, hell bent on controlling the knowledge of what lies beyond our horizon. For decades, amateur and professional ufologists have studied the possibility of extraterrestrial beings in our universe. There have been countless stories of abductions, hundreds of grainy videos of oddly shaped objects zooming through the night sky, and even an attempt at a coordinated storming of the highly secretive Area 51. In recent months, our own government has even admitted to the inability to explain what UFOs could possibly be, if not alien spacecraft, and has released footage of mysterious flying objects taken by Navy pilots. But those in the close-knit community of serious extraterrestrial hunters claim that these statements are nothing more than an attempt to control information and distract from more damning evidence. Many believe that at work behind the scenes are an elite team of agents, the real-life inspiration for the blockbuster movie franchise. And there's plenty of evidence to back their claims up. On a clear June day in 1947, Harold Dahl was patrolling the East Bay of Murray Island in Washington's Puget Sound. He brought his son Charles and his dog along for what was supposed to be an easy afternoon of gathering logs. Taking a moment to scan the skies and enjoy the peace that only comes with a day on the water, Dahl was shocked to spot six donut-shaped flying objects hovering about a half a mile above his boat. As he stared, slack-jawed and disbelieving, the objects seemed to begin to spew something from their centers, and metallic debris rained down upon him and his passengers. White, very lightweight metal that resembled lava rocks showered the boat deck, striking both his son and his dog. While Charles escaped with only an injured arm, Dow's dog was not as lucky. Amid his confusion, Dow remembered his camera and snapped a few pictures of the aircraft before fleeing the area. Unsure of what else to do, Dow shared the photos with his supervisor, a man named Fred Christman. Christman was skeptical but went back to the scene himself to see what he could find. Christman found not only the debris Dow had described, but saw for himself the strange aircrafts that were responsible for it. The following morning, Dahl was visited by a man in a black suit at a local diner. The man knew what Dahl had witnessed off Murray Island, and he warned him to never speak of the incident again, lest bad things should happen. What I have said is proof to you that I know a great deal more about this experience of yours than you will ever want to believe. The mysterious man in black stated, Claims much like Dow's prompted a full-scale federal investigation, which deemed Dow's sighting and run-in with the black-clad visitor nothing more than a hoax. In fact, Dow and Crimson both later claimed it was made up. But is it possible that the same government that claimed the sighting was a hoax was only attempting to cover their tracks? And would men who feared their sanity be willing to agree? And what does it mean that on the very same day as Dahl's sighting, private pilot Kenneth Arnold reported seeing speeding unidentified objects against the peak of Mount Rainier, mere miles from where Dahl was showered with debris? The Murray Island incident was quickly forgotten as a country in the haze of post-World War II 
processed other tragedies. But in 1957, author Gary Barker published his book, They Knew Too Much About Flying Saucers, where he connected the dots between the strange man who had visited Dow and another story of three men dressed all in black who treated UFO enthusiast Albert K. Bender to a visit in 1953. Bender had long been fascinated by all things supernatural and formed the International Flying Saucer Bureau in 1952. The organization, the first major civilian UFO club in the world, was an immediate success. In March of 1953, Bender was approached by three men, dressed all in black. The men entered Bender's home, and according to Bender, they floated about a foot off the floor. They looked like clergymen, but wore hats similar to the Holmberg style. The faces were not clearly discernible, for the hats partly hid and shaded them. The eyes of all three figures suddenly lit up like flashlight bulbs. They seemed to burn into my very soul as the pains above my eyes became almost unbearable. After this strange visit, Bender became ill and couldn't eat for days. He suffered frequent headaches and his co-workers reported that he appeared scared. Bender abruptly shuttered the International Flying Saucers Bureau and canceled the publication of his paper, outlining theories of government cover-ups of UFOs in space review. If the visitors meant to frighten Bender into abandoning his work with UFOs, they succeeded handedly. But perhaps most damning of all this is the story of Paul Benowitz. Mrs. Benowitz was a successful electronics entrepreneur living in New Mexico in 1979. He began seeing strange lights in the sky and picking up otherworldly transmissions on his amateur radio equipment. Although he lived just across the road from Kirkland Air Force Base, Benowitz was convinced that the things he was discovering belonged to the extraterrestrials. He contacted the Air Force to share his alien concerns. Air Force Special Investigations Officer Richard Doty says that what Benowitz was eavesdropping on was not extraterrestrial beings, but rather top secret military operations. Doty and others told Benowitz they were interested in his findings and encouraged him to keep digging deeper. As Benowitz dove deep into his research, the government investigators were surveilling his every move. They planted fake props for him to discover, provided him with software that they promised would interpret alien languages, and watched as he spiraled into madness with his obsession. In 1988, Benowitz's family had him checked into a psychiatric facility. Dottie claims the Air Force was simply conducting surveillance but the lengths they went to in spreading false information leaves some wondering if Dottie and his team were real life men in black, bent on spreading disinformation while guiding those on the right track further from the truth. While there have been few cases as well documented as what happened to Paul Benowitz, evidence of the men in black is ever present. Dr. Herbert Hopkins reported a hairless, pale man in black visiting him when he worked as a consultant on a UFO case. The man in black made a coin, fade into non-existence before Hopkins' eyes, and advised him to destroy his research, lest the same thing happen to him. Jim Templeton discovered an alien-like figure in the background of a photo of his daughter, and after Kodak verified its authenticity, he made his findings public. Shortly after, he was visited by two agents who referred to themselves as number 9 and number 10. They questioned Templeton about the photo and demanded to see the field where it was taken. Paul Miller shot at a humanoid figure exiting a luminous disc and the next day, three men in black suits appeared at his work and told him the encounter would best be forgotten. Professor Peter Reithowicz was reading a book about UFOs in the library when a strange, pale man wearing all blacks sat next to him and began to question him about his interest in flying saucers. I don't know, maybe these stories are easy for you to brush off, explain away, as some bumpkin looking for his 15 minutes of fame. But I'm going to leave you with one last story that may have you questioning everything. In 2002, actor and comedian Dan Aykroyd signed a contract with the Sci-Fi Channel 
to produce a series on UFOs called Out There. Aykroyd filmed eight episodes for the first season. While filming the season finale, Aykroyd stepped out to take a phone call from Britney Spears about appearing on Saturday Night Live with her. As he chatted, Aykroyd noticed a black Ford sedan across the street. A very tall man dressed in black stepped out of the car and gave him a hard look. Aykroyd glanced around to see if anyone else was near him, and when he turned back to the car, it and the man vanished. Two hours later, the show was canceled without explanation, and none of the episodes ever saw the light of day. Amidst doubt and condemnation, Aykroyd maintains his belief that the strange man and vanishing vehicle he saw that day are connected to the cancellation of his show. Why would a celebrity with a net worth of over a hundred million dollars fabricate such a story? He certainly didn't use it to promote his work in any way. The footage from his show never even made it to DVD. Richard Dotty confirmed that the US government was indeed infiltrating UFO believer circles and working to stop the truth and spread disinformation. Was this another case of the men in black just doing their job? Was Aykroyd, just like Benowitz, and all the others before him, just someone who knew a little too much? Perhaps you'd care to investigate for yourself. Just don't be surprised if there's a knock on your door from the men in black, if you get too close to the truth. Thanks for listening to Greybeard's Jewels, a step into the unknown. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe to the podcast on Spotify or wherever you like to listen.